20 years with a sustainable architect and I thought it would be nice to take you through my history, so the last 20 years. In 1992 I started my PhD and uh, I wanted to uh, make energy, uh, buildings energy produced instead of energy consumed, so that was the hypothesis of the uh, PhD. I never finished it. <laughs> uh, I'm still busy, my promoter is still alive, <laughs> and uh, this year my company thinks it's 20 years, uh, so I thought I would finish it. But the funny thing is that in 20 years time there's not so much being changed in technology, so, uh, um, but there was a lot of being changed in the attitude towards uh, sustainability, which was quite interesting of course. This is my career, I started in uh, almost 20 years ago my office. Um, and well, before uh, I was a sustainable architect, nobody was very interested. Um, but later on, more and more corporate world, uh, in, well, it was interested in sustainability. And I benefit from this. Um, in 2005, for example, you had a magazine, uh, Sustainable Architecture. It was stopped because nobody was interested. So then I s started an office in China in 2005 with the idea that uh, they were interested in sustainable architecture. But I never built anything there, so my conclusion was that not building anything was the most sustainable thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> but now you see that they're very much interested, so maybe I was too early, or maybe I was not a good businessman. But anyway, uh, during 2007, uh, you had Al Gore and they had the inconvenient truth, and people started to become really interested in sustainability, and also the corporate world. So I got a chance to uh, make buildings for TNT and Transavia. And later on, I just got more and more involved in other kind of type of well things like um, housing, for example, sustainable housing, sustainable schools, sustainable universities. And my last acquisition is uh, sustainable Offside Dyke. So I'm mm -hmm. the architect of the Offside Dyke with uh, the fellows of old of uh, landscape architects. We're going to prepare actually uh, well the next uh, 50 years of. Uh, uh, protection of water, because the, uh, the idea is that uh, in 2050, 50 centimeters of water level raise will be expected, so which is quite a lot of course, and this because of, well, I think uh, our doing of uh, uh, not being sustainable. So there's a need for a sustainable society, and a CO2 neutral society, and how do you do this? <laughs> well, this, uh, this is a house, it's also an estate, but it's a modern estate. And uh, well, uh, talking about the attitude, uh, we started in 2006, and this person uh, had the possibility to buy a piece of land in Zeeland, and he could uh, build a house, but he had to restore the ecological zone. So he spent millions of, millions of euros to restore the re ecological zone. And we started planning uh, the house, and it took a long time to build the house, also for the planning and to get permits. He lived uh, three years next door in the caravan. So. It's not about the house, more about the idea how to get to raise the, well, to, to make his dream. And he, had, he was planning to buy a lot of cars. He had no cars at all. And I said, well, if you have such a beautiful estate, it would be nice that you are not intrusive, that you are low profile on the on, on the on the landscape. So maybe we should put a lot of program into the ground. And suppose you would not buy one car, then we can make the whole uh, well estate uh, sustainable. And then he thought about it as well. I'm not interested in sustainability, but later on, um, when the EIS revolved, he started to become interested and said, okay, what's a good plan, we're going to do this. So this building now has become sustainable and autarchic in the sense that, because of the fact that we, well, we produce our own energy, we make our own water, and we, uh, we, we cycle the, the sewer and so forth. So it's quite interesting that the attitude in 2007, when you start designing in 2014, has not been changed. Which is quite hopeful, you could say, and also a lot of things are possible. So this is the high end of the, the um, well, housing. We also make social housing now in Amsterdam, which are energy neutral. So it's possible. But one of the things we have we have had a chance was 2007 when I said the corporate world was interested in sustainability, um, and um, we had at that time we had Peter Bakker. He was a, a CEO of TNT. And he would have CO2 neutral. Um, we have partial companies, say, and uh, they have, you have to Dow, Dow, Dow Jones Sustainable Index, and you want to become one on this Dow, Dow Jones Sustainable Index. And uh, you want to have a CO neutral organization, and therefore he needed also CO2 CO neutral buildings. And we won the competitions of five buildings uh, throughout the land, 
and people would just actually could be closer to work, to their homes, so they couldn't don't have to drive. It was like like a flexible office space. But 2007 was also the way of uh, the start of the crisis. So we only built one, and what became the headquarters. The other four were not built. But the interesting thing, and the most well, let's say innovative thing in the last 25 years was the attitude. So not the techniques we use in this building are so new, but the idea that uh, TNT wanted to rent the housing or the, their office, including energy, which is uh, nobody asked before, what's my energy bill? So it's quite shocking, but it's 2007, so no long ago. Um, and they said, well, what's sustainability? And then we came up with a contract, um, <coughs> and there's like a certification of sustainability. As, at that time, it called, uh, it's a certification out of America, it's a lead, and you can have different kind of um, well, levels, and you want to have a lead platinum level, which was like the, 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 the start of the contract, you could say, and that's also where we could have been uh, well, accountable for, in the sense of, well, as you hear a lot of times, well, sustainability is, I have the most sustainable house or the most sustainable office, but this is how you can ver verify it and also make it uh, in, into a contract and also uh, the value of the, the office becomes higher because of the fact that you have like a certification of platinum which is quite difficult. One of the things was that you cannot buy uh, your uh, products in a range of 500 miles, so that's 800 kilometers, to make sure that your CO2 print of building is also reduced. Um, there was a lot of other things like site planning, energy, water management, indoor environmental quality, which was quite interesting. And it's quite interesting that uh, if you look at this, um, what you have to do for this, it meant you didn't, you didn't have to use non-toxic materials. Well, we thought it was obvious that you don't use non-toxic materials, but it's quite difficult actually to find non-toxic materials. So everything is in, well, included in the furniture and in the walls. So we had to reinvent almost a lot of new products just to, to make sure that the building was uh, well, healthy, you could say, which is of course a very important point of sustainability. Another thing was that because of the due of uh, making sure that the building was energy neutral, we had to even turn the whole building on to, towards uh, the site. And here you can see that... Can you have the plants? <laughs> I did this and we have to change the we have to change the direction of the, the whole uh, uh, building. So here you have the article, article uh, urban plan, and we asked the urban planner if you could change the building in order to get the, the energy neutrality. So this is how far it goes when you go to think about an energy neutral society. You have to also think about urban structure and how you organize your buildings towards the I said it's the organized buildings towards the sun. But one of the things which was very important was the connectivity. Well, of course, if you have an uh, energy neutral building, it doesn't mean you have a good office. So one of the things we said, well, you want to have a connected building. People want, want to connect people to each other. Um, and we hide the elevator, also not to, also not to waste energy. But the, the good thing was that we uh, gave an alternative, so it was a big stair going in steps towards through the atrium, uh, which made that people also meet each other. So one of, this, one of the things we thought would be interesting if you talk about sustainability, it's not also about energy and material, but also how you use it. It's going to be more effective, more conducive for uh, buildings. Um, and then uh, we came also to the conclusion that making a building like this energy neutral is very complicated. Um, and we thought it would be better and more energy efficient and more money-wise efficient just to think broader in a, in a sense that maybe you can exchange energy with other surrounding buildings. So now we have uh, this, this, we call this the green machine, um, this plant, you could say so it's a big plant which runs on biofuels and it produces electricity and also produces heat, but the heat will be uh, transported to the hotel next door, so you have a balance. So the interesting conclusion for us was that after so many years making an energy building energy neutral building, that it would be better to see it in the broader spectrum of, of the city. Um, and I came to the other, um, well, conclusion you could say. This is how we um, 
but everybody talks how much energy you use during the day, nobody knows. And um, what the interesting thing is, you look at this, it's unfortunately in Dutch, but using your car, this is per day the kilowatt hours you use. This is per day what you use, so the car and making your car and maintaining the roads is one of the largest uh, well, amounts, by everybody knows. If you fly to uh, Mallorca, for example, you already have quite a lot of uh, energy produced. You see that uh, building a house is not so much energy, lighting, heating the house is quite a lot. And all the other things is actually about shipping your goods towards your um, house. So if you uh, uh, wrap it up and put it together, you see that uh, almost two-thirds of the energy use is transportation. Transportation between your house, transportation of products, and 23% of the, the energy use is actually uh, your house, so, or your office, or whatever. So suppose this is energy neutral, you still don't have a CO2 neutral society, you have to do something more than this. Um, and I came up with another uh, well, study we made, uh, we did this for the, the, the government uh, about s uh, sustainability, and they asked us to make a very sustainable uh, office for a thousand uh, civil servants, and then we thought, well, we made already one for TNT, so we might as well do something else with the money. And uh, we uh, had to be on the Zuidas, and we called it the Zuidkas, which is, means greenhouse, uh, the south greenhouse. Um, but this is uh, our conclusion that, oh, sorry, that um, this is how the, the city is organized. You live, you work, the food, uh, everything is next to each other, and you have to drive in between. But if you want to reduce the CO2 um, well, consumption, you can say, you should mix it, and mix it totally in, in, in an urban, urban scale. So instead of making uh, well, people drive from A to B, you make sure that you don't have to drive so, so far. Um, and then um, we thought we make uh, make a study. If you have, uh, for example, housing and, and offices, you see that they have different kind of use of heat. So uh, housing needs heat and they need the south. Um, and offices need uh, not so much heat, they need, of course, uh, otherwise they get too hot, so they, they can be on the offside. And we also uh, put a, we thought, well, what happens if you make some agriculture and put a greenhouse on top of the, the building? What would work? And then um, we tried to, uh, well, it's an imaginary uh, idea, of course. We tried to calculate if everything, if all the cycles we can close, the, the, of waste, of energy, of water, of CO2, and this was a possibility uh, using uh, well, bio uh, mass and uh, making gas out of it and heat, and so it's a quite complex system, but anyway, the idea was interesting and we calculated it, and then uh, we thought, well, oh, it can be an interesting house to live in, uh, and this was our idea at that moment, and so there was a study, and then we wrapped around it, and we put it in the, in the closet, and we thought, okay, well, it's interesting. And then we came, uh, we were a bit challenged to uh, make, to design uh, the most sustainable hotel in Europe for Intercontinental. It's going to be built on the Amstel, Amstel Quartier, of Amstel Station. Amstel Station is a uh, train to uh, Utrecht, it's a waternet building, and here you see the city. And then uh, we thought, well, we might as well make the side cars. And, uh, so uh, we came up with some ideas and uh, we studied uh, uh, hotels, four-star hotel, and what you see in hotels that are 24 hours a day on. And we realized that uh, nobody is, in, the, the client is not 24 hours in a hotel room, for example, or maybe eight hours. So if you look at the, the building, you can change the building into, uh, into a, a way of actually make sure that the building is not on 24 hours, but only on when the client or the guest is in, into the hotel. So it's a tracking device, and you come into the office on the hotel, then, um, for example, the, the heat of your room will be started up. If you go out of your room, the heat will be shut off, like what you have, like this the key card, electricity goes off, but the whole building uh, in your, or the whole uh, installation will go off. Uh, for us, it's very interesting to see what, how much energy is used and how much, well, nobody ever thought about uh, anything like, uh, for example, the minibar is always 24 hours on. Nobody thought about the smart minibar, for example. And so there's a lot of new developments possible. And one of the things we, did, uh, we thought would be very interesting, 
you also see it in the architecture of the building. So every hotel room has uh, shutters which react on the weather. So if it's nice weather outside, it's the sun outside, it's hot. Uh, in the summer then it closes when the, the, gas, the gas is not in there. In the winter time it opens so it gains the, the heat. Uh, it's, uh, when it's in the winter time it's night for them it closes so it insulates it extra. So this building re reacts on the seasons and the clients and on the, on the weather conditions. So we will later on, well we start building it now so we are quite anxious to see how it will work. And you'll see that the whole building always changes all the time. So it's quite exciting actually. But one of the things we did also, we put also a greenhouse on top of the, on top of the hotel and we tried to um, get as much as possible reuse of water, reuse, reuse of uh, heat and reuse of also kitchen uh, waste for example and try to see where the optimum is. Our clients are private clients and they're very willing just to go all the way and just to want to push us every time, well, can it be more sustainable? Which is of course very interesting because 20 years ago that was unthinkable but now people really want to have a sustainable building because the leases of uh, hotels are 25 years so they want after 25 years that they will have up-to-date standard the last, you would say, the last uh, standard uh, uh, of technology that the, 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 the investment will be worthwhile 